All right, turning to politics now, I'm going to talk about The Voice. And I have to keep returning to this because it threatens to change our country forever. You see, if it succeeds, it is going to divide our nation along racial lines, creating an apartheid system of governance. It's flat out racist. And for that reason alone, this proposal is indefensible. More people seem to be becoming aware of these dangers, which probably accounts for why the inflammatory language by the yes advocates has lifted a notch or 10. Apparently now, you see, if you vote no or you advocate for a no vote, to a special race-based cabal of elites running the country, well, that means you're a racist or a fascist or a white supremacist or a Judas. That last one is especially poignant given today's Easter Sunday and Judas was the betrayer of Jesus. Now, I'd suggest that those pushing this voice are actually the ones who are betraying our country. And their intemperance and their inflammatory words suggest they've actually got something to hide. You see, they're trying very hard to deflect the very valid questions that need to be answered about a proposal which will change our constitution and our system of governance forever. They know, and we know that they know, that this is an entirely unnecessary change to our founding document. It's going to create yet another Aboriginal lobby group to politicians, which doesn't need constitutional recognition. And yet the push is on to make it a constitutional issue. We're entitled to ask why. Is it to make a relative few feel better about themselves? Or is it about entrenching a racially based elite to rule over us? Hmm, maybe it's both. Who would know? Because those pushing this divisive and racist garbage will not tell us what substantive difference this constitutional change will make in the lives of Aboriginal people. And in fact, sometimes they even contradict each other in a rush to paper over the flaws in what they're putting forward. Some say it's a purely advisory role, while others, claim it's going to have extraordinary powers. And one of those powers, supposedly, is an authority that no cabinet minister in this country has in itself. And that's the right to appeal legislative decisions to the High Court on the basis of a lack of consultation. I wasn't asked, so I'm going to take it off to the High Court. Now, this is an important issue because it means virtually every decision of government could have to go through the Aboriginal approval process, lest it lead to a legal challenge. I reckon we've got enough of that black tape nonsense already. I mean, that impediment, that black tape to progress started decades ago. Now, I'm going to guess it's one of the fastest growing handbrakes to businesses in the country. Back in the 1990s, I remember a proposed bridge over the River Murray from Goolwa to High Marsh Island was stopped, supposedly because it was declared sacred to a group of Aboriginal women. Now, these women wouldn't publicly disclose why it was sacred, and the Labor government of the time basically accepted their word for it. This famously became known as secret women's business and was later revealed to be linked to infertility if the building of the bridge went ahead. Now, during a notoriously and torturously long saga, it was Sky News' own Chris Kenny, then a much younger reporter, who managed to elicit the truth from one Aboriginal elder that these claims, these secret women's business, were basically made up. A subsequent Royal Commission also reached the conclusion that this women's business had been fabricated. The bridge proceeded eventually, and now the Aboriginal population, well, it's among the fastest growing ethnic groups in the nation. The 2020 census had it up by more than 25% in just four years. Clearly, despite the claim of these women to stop the bridge, there's not been an infertility issue attached to building it. And I wonder how many other Aboriginal cultural claims are in the same fabrication boat. Who will run a check on any of the claims that will inevitably be made by this proposed new tribal house of lords? Just this week, we saw another project blocked on the claims of an Aboriginal tribal mysticism. A pastoral company owned by Andrew and Nicola Forrest were denied, on appeal I should point out, permission to build two granite quarries and 10 weirs along the Ashburton River which runs through Mindaroo Station, about 1,300 kilometres north of Perth. The project was blocked because there were, quote, fears the weirs could kill the Aboriginal water serpent spirit in the river. I don't know if the projects were a good idea or not, but using some mythical sacred serpent as the excuse to stop them? <laughs> Reeks of rubbish to me. Don't get me wrong, I get it. Different groups of Australians have different religious and cultural beliefs. Sometimes those beliefs come into conflict and we actually have to make a choice. But 
let me be plain, this country was actually built on the belief that many of us celebrate on this very day, Christianity. It informs our laws, our customs, our interaction with each other. But I also point out Christianity is the only religion that the sneering elite seem to frown upon. Apparently you can embrace any other form of mysticism or worship and it will be revered and respected. But you try and introduce a Christian voice to the public square and wait for the vilification. But back to this Aboriginal mysticism. We're constantly told how Aboriginal culture is the oldest continuing culture in the world. When I was a kid, it was 20,000 years old, and then later on it's 40,000. Now it's 65,000 years of continuous culture. Let's accept that for a moment. But also, let's ask why, if that is the case, has this culture and practice changed so much in recent decades? Let me give you an example or two. When I grew up, Aboriginal beliefs were known as the dream time. Now, they're suddenly known as the dreaming. Now, I find it incredible to ditch 65,000 years of tradition virtually overnight by changing how you refer to, you know, this oldest continuous belief system. And then there's the welcome to country and the acknowledgement of country. The former is seemingly at every public event, while the latter precedes even contributions at some private meetings now that I have to go to. It's like a modern spell designed to make you immune to criticism. Well, we're told too that these are ancient customs, but I want to point out the welcome to country can be traced back to 1976. That was when Ernie Dingo's dance troupe had to come up with a new impromptu routine after an awkward standoff with visiting Maori and Cook Islanders. You see, the visitors refused to perform at an arts festival until they were ritually welcomed. So began the ancient tradition of the world's oldest continuous culture, which has been passed down from one generation to another for ooh, nearly 47 years now. That said, in a very strange case of lending support to the enemy, if you need another reason to vote no at the coming referendum, I think we should listen to Marcia Langton. This week, she said if the referendum failed, quote, how are they going to ever ask an Indigenous person, a traditional owner, for a welcome to country? How are they ever going to be able to ask me to come and speak at their conference? If they have the temerity to do it, of course the answer is going to be no, end of quote. Well, in my opinion, that's a win for all of us. No more welcomes to our own country, no more hollow acknowledgements, and no more of Marsha Langton's pious public lectures. I should also point out that Langton was one of those backing in the fabricated secret women's business of the High Marsh Island Bridge, Bridge all those years ago, despite being quoted at the time as saying, I personally do not know much about the facts of the case, and it is not proper that I should know. Hmm. That reminds me a bit of when Bill Shorten didn't know what Julia Gillard said, but that he was 100% supportive of it. This is what passes for governance in today's day and age. The substance matters less than the tribe you're in or the tribe you're cheering on. And I mention these things because I happen to think that we're being conned, not just in a cultural sense, but I think we're being conned financially and politically. And I think some of the Aboriginal people are being conned too. This weekend, the Australian's Greg Bearup had a fantastic expose on what's going on in the very lucrative world of Aboriginal art. Paintings from some well-regarded Aboriginal artists can sell for tens of thousands of dollars. But Bearup exposed that white artists often lent more than a paintbrush to produce the works. There's Rosie Palmer, the white manager of an artist collective who offered to help one artist, quote, juice this up a bit and suggested adding another rock hole uh, would be useful to the overwhelming uh, impact of the painting. And when shown a photo of her holding a paintbrush, she's then quoted in the Bear Up story as saying, I absolutely deny that I'm painting in this photo. I'm holding an unused brush and a bucket of pre-prepared red wash that Regitti had already used to lay down the chukula, which is a rock hole, and passed back to me. Well, Here's the video so you can judge the truth of that statement for yourself.
Yeah, if that's not painting, I guess it must be more secret women's business. Now, I'm sure the art collectors would love to know they're out there shelling big bucks out for traditional art that's been juiced up by white women. Now, of course, this and the other things I've mentioned are an inconvenience to those pushing to redefine our national governance arrangements. But these are the same people generally who have been responsible for spending or handling hundreds of billions of dollars of your dollars, of taxpayer dollars, to make very little difference in the lives of so many Aboriginal people. A voice will entrench these elites at the very top of a racial divide in this country. We'll have more sacred serpents and secret women's business, more questionable Aboriginal art, more bureaucracy and more billions flowing into a race-based system of governance and into the pockets of those who control it. It's a system that already seems rife with abuse and misuse of mysticism, of money and culture. And the voice will make this worse. It will not bring us together. Instead, it will divide us like never before.